Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all of you. My name is Chris Pax, and I'm dean of the school. And this is, uh, I'm very happy to have the first of two lectures that are part of the 2012 Richard Ullman Lecture Series. This is something that we do every year. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson School teams up with Princeton University Press. We invite a distinguished scholar of international affairs to come to the university give a series of lectures that are then um, published, turned into a book, and published by the press. So it's turned into a really terrific tradition. Uh, this year we have Joseph Nye, who is an old friend of, of Princeton's. He's a 1958 Princeton alumnus. And he's, hey, okay, you got that? Are they your classmates? Yes. Yeah, OK. And one of many wonderful 1958 Princeton alums. And he is uh, the Distinguished Service Professor at Harvard University and former dean of the Harvard Kennedy School. We can clap at that, too. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm not going to do a long introduction, but I just will note that he is considered the co-founder of the international relations theory of neoliberalism. And, uh, and we're fortunate to have here in the school, on a regular basis, uh, the other co-founder of uh, this theory. And that is uh, Robert Cohane, who's a professor, professor of international affairs here at the Wilson School. Um, because of their long-standing professional as well as personal relationship, I invited Professor Cohane to be the one to introduce Professor Nye. So. Thank you very much, Dean Paxson. Uh, I, I have known our speaker for 45 years, since January 1967, but as Dean Paxson said, Princeton has known him longer. Joseph Nye is University Distinguished Service Professor professor and, and former dean of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He's also a native of New Jersey and a summa cum laude graduate of Princeton in the great class of 1958, well represented here tonight. He went on to, on to be a Rhodes Scholar and earned his PhD at Harvard, where he started uh, uh, teaching in 1965. In, in the 1970s, we wrote two books together and have been best friends since. Joseph Nye has known Richard H. Ullman, whom we honor with this lecture tonight, ever since they were Rhodes Scholars together at Oxford beginning in 1958. Richard H. Ullman is, is the Emeritus Professor of International Relations at Princeton. He is a distinguished scholar of international security, particularly in Europe, and a leading historian of Anglo-Soviet relations in the crucial period of war and revolution between 1917 and 1921. In the late 1970s, he served on, on the editorial board of, of the New York Times, and he was director of the 1980s project of the Council on, on Foreign Relations, which, which produced much good work. Joseph Nye has held several high positions in the United States government, including being Assistant Secretary of, of Defense in the Clinton administration. Over the two decades since the end of the Cold War, he has published several important books on power and leadership, including Bound to Lead, Changing, uh, the Changing Nature of American Power in, in 1990, a pathbreaking book. I know it's pathbreaking because I thought he was wrong at the time and I changed my mind. Uh, and most recently, The Future of Power, published last year. There could be no better choice than Joseph S. Nye for the 2012 Al Alman Lectures, and no more suitable topics for him, him to discuss than the ones he has chosen. Tomorrow, he will be speaking on ethics and leadership, but tonight his topic is presidents and the transformation of American foreign policy in the 20th century. Uh, please join me in welcoming back to, back to Princeton, Professor Joseph S. Nye. Well, thank you, Bob. It's, it's always a pleasure to uh, come back to Princeton. Uh, but when Chuck Myers uh, asked me about a year ago, whether I would come back and give a set of lectures. Um, I was suffering what uh, I guess might be considered postpartum exhaustion. I just finished a book. And he was saying, would you give these lectures and we'll publish it as a book? And I thought exactly how my wife must have felt when we discovered we were pregnant again after three months of having delivered the previous child. 
But uh, uh, it all worked out, incidentally. He's, he's doing very well. But, the, uh, but when he said that the lectures were in honor of Dick Ullman, then I knew I had no choice. Um, Dick Ullman was a man uh, that I looked up to as a uh, three years his junior at Oxford, and then again uh, when we were both on the faculty as junior faculty members at Harvard, and then again when he was running the 1980s project at the Council on Foreign Relations. So the chance to honor uh, Dick Ullman uh, was uh, greater than the sense of exhaustion I felt about just having finished one book and being asked to prepare lecture notes for another. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to be introduced by my friend Bob Cohen. As, as, as he said, we've been friends for uh, uh, more than four decades, and, and we've shared so many ideas that I no longer know which of my ideas are mine and which are his, and I suspect that I've stolen a good number of his, uh, but I no longer can tell, which is a real sign of intellectual companionship as well as friendship. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is talk about um, uh, some patterns in history of American foreign policy of the 20th century, and the, particularly the patterns which led us to where we are today. But I should warn you, before we start on patterns of history, that uh, anybody who tries to see patterns can sometimes uh, be surprised or, or uh, the outcomes may not be quite what they expected. Um, there was one day when I went to the horse races, uh, it was a May 5th, and I thought, hmm, 5-5, five, five, I'm going to bet on the fifth horse in the fifth race. And I was right, he came in fifth. <laughs> so you may feel that way a bit after you hear what I have to say about uh, uh, precedents and the creation of the American era, uh, but I hope not. In any case, at the beginning of the 21st century, the United States uh, was in an extraordinary situation as the only superpower, the only country with global military, economic, and cultural reach. And that raises a question about why. And some of these quotes up here, starting with George Washington and finally with my, and then Henry Luce with his his famous American century point, and then finally my colleague at, uh, at Harvard, Steve Walt, says, you know, it's, a, it's, it's not normal or ordinary. Uh, you know, this is a very odd thing uh, that one country should be stride the world as we did by the end of the century. And uh, uh, why is the question that I want to try to ask uh, uh, tonight. Now, political scientists tend to answer that question with answer that question with structural theories, which are attractive because they provide, uh, or appear to provide, broad general explanations. Everything seems inevitable. Uh, we humans are embedded in complex uh, structures of culture, social relations, and power, which affect and constrain us. Um, structure overwhelms agency. Uh, different analysts cut into it in different places, but as Karl Marx correctly observed, Men make history, but not under circumstances of their own choosing. International structural theories uh, come in different flavors and different types. Liberals stress technology and globalization. Uh, Marxists stress the imperatives of capital, trade, and profit. Realists uh, note the growth of American power resources and say that once a power a country gets that many resources, expansion to becoming dominant is almost a law of nature. But uh, in contrast, people who study leadership tend to place their emphasis on the individual, not on the structural or systemic forces. And what raises an interesting question, to what extent was presidential leadership important in the creation of this American era? To what extent was agency an important part of this? As we try to answer that, uh, we have to say that if you just rely on structural points of view, uh, you might say that American hegemony is inevitable, but then you have anomalies that you have to answer. Um, why was it, for example, if it's all inevitable and, and taken care of by structural forces, why was it that um, there were periods when we shirked 
our international role? Or in uh, John Eikenberry's terms, why was it that we turned out to be a liberal hegemony rather than a more imperial form of domination? So <clears throat> that draws us back to this question of what role did leadership play? Uh, one of the problems with leadership theory is something called uh, leadership attribution error. Uh, you know, all around us, if something goes right or wrong, we tend to blame, blame the leaders. So uh, losing sports team, what do you do? Fire the coach. Uh, the company does well, perhaps for reasons that are totally extraneous, give the CEO a bonus. Um, and that's leadership attribution error. Conjunction in time doesn't prove causation to determine the strength of the effect. To what extent were the men who presided over the creation of the American era simply responding to, or were they shaping events? Sometimes you will have a leader who finds a fork in the road. It's important which branch the leader takes. But sometimes you find a leader who creates a fork in the road. And we call those leaders transformational in the sense that they're changing what might otherwise be the course of history. And that raises new questions. As one columnist put it, good politicians win arguments. Every now and then, somebody comes up and changes the argument. For example, after September 11, 2001, any American president might have, uh, let's used force against uh, the Taliban government in Afghanistan uh, in response to their harboring of al-Qaeda. But in choosing to also invade Iraq, George W. Bush created a fork in the road and became, for better or worse, a transformational leader. I'll go into this and in particularly ethical implications in some detail tomorrow, but just the point is that there is a extraordinary difference between leaders who can create the fork as opposed to merely take one that's there. Now, if we try to think about the effect of leaders on history, uh, we realize it's a matter of degree, uh, and different leaders may get things right or wrong. But so may we, as we look at the details of causation, uh, get things right or long, wrong. Each age has access to new facts and incorporates new biases. I, one of the things, a theme that will run through my comments today and tomorrow is my ambivalence about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, I started out uh, very strongly Wilsonian. Uh, after all, I'm a graduate of a Woodrow Wilson school. I was given the Princeton University Woodrow Wilson Prize, and I've always been an admirer of Wilson's creation, the League of Nations and the UN. But I have to say that in these lectures, you'll find a back and forth effort to try to balance views of Woodrow Wilson. Teddy Roosevelt was a popular president who brought American foreign policy into the 20th century. In contrast, Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy of promoting democracy in the League of Nations was a failure and rejected by the American people for two decades after his death. Nonetheless, Henry Kissinger argues that by the middle of the 20th century, Wilson's ideas had more influence on American opinion on foreign policy than did Teddy Roosevelt. What do we compare and when do we judge? History doesn't produce final verdicts because each age reinterprets the light past in the light of its own interests and preoccupation. Nonetheless, it seems useful to distinguish leadership in creating ideas from leadership in implementing policy actions, and to set thresholds where you can make a judgment, whether it be a decade or two decades or something like that. By these criteria, Wilson may have been a leader in codifying certain ideas that had deep roots in both European and American liberal traditions, but he clearly failed as a transformational policy leader in his old time. Again, I'll say more about this tomorrow, but the point to watch is that successful transformation requires not just vision, but also capacity for implementation. Let me say a few more words about transformational leadership. For the last three decades, leadership theory has placed a great deal of emphasis on this term, and it's now in the public domain. You'll read lots of editorials about transformational leadership. 
It starts really with James McGregor Burns, who introduced the term in 1978, and he used it to describe leaders who use conflict and crisis to raise their followers' consciousness and transform them by appealing to their followers' higher ideals and moral values rather than base incentives of feed, greer, and hatred. Transactional leaders, on the other hand, rely on hard power resources of carrots and sticks to appeal to their followers' self-interest. This has become very much a fixed idea or a polarity in leadership theory. The trouble is it's built on two very bad confusions in terminology and analytical concept. One is that Burns built value into his definition. Uh, thus, a Hitler, who clearly transformed Germany for the worse, cannot be a transformational leader by definition in Burns's terms. In general, I argue that it's better to distinguish questions of good and bad from questions of effectiveness, and I'll deal with ethical questions tomorrow as only with effectiveness questions today. A second reason why this theory, uh, transformational, transactional, is confusing is that it takes three quite different things and uses the same word for all three of them. The objectives the leader has, the styles the leader uses, and the outcomes the leader produces. These three dimensions of what a leader seeks, what he, what he or she achieves, and what methods they use are not the same thing. Franklin Roosevelt is often cited as a transformational leader, and in the 1930s, uh, he certainly did transform American domestic politics and society. Things were never the same again. But in foreign policy, FDR was unable to transform American isolationist attitudes. And he used very indirect transactional bargaining methods to pursue this, the, his goal of moving American foreign policy toward a support for Great Britain before World War II. Uh, his followers were ready for transformation on social issues, but not on foreign policy. So he adapted transactional methods in their place. Harry Truman is another example of a successful leader who developed transformational objectives while in office, but tended to be transactional in his style. And sometimes you can have a leader who seeks only incremental change, like Bill Clinton, but who will use an incremental style. In fact, you can see this in this chart, if it comes up properly, um, of which you can see in this table that uh, you can have a leader like Truman, who's transformational in his objectives, transactional in his style, or you can have Eisenhower, Fred Greenstein, the great expert on Eisenhower is here, who what I would say was largely transactional in, uh, transactional in style, but also largely incremental in his objectives. And if you can look at uh, Franklin Roosevelt, inspirational in style and transformational objectives, but Bill Clinton, who was basically uh, inspiration on style, but incremental in his objectives. Now, of course, leaders don't fit neatly in boxes and all try to adapt different styles in different contexts. Uh, nonetheless, leaders generally tend toward a predominant style. And there's a third question, which is, do they succeed or not? Uh, if not, they would be failed transformational leaders. A leader can be transformational in intentions and objectives, inspirational in style, but not successful in transformational outcomes. Because the theorists, in the way they form these terms, squish these all together, it often creates confusion as people talk about transformation. So I'll try to keep these separate this evening. Now, leaders can also change their objectives and styles over the course of their careers. Otto von Bismarck, one of the great transformational leaders in international politics, um, had objectives which were clearly transformation in the unification of Germany under Prussian leadership, but largely incremental and status quo oriented after that success. And as we will see below, Franklin Roosevelt changed his foreign policy objectives and style quite dramatically uh, during his presidency. Theorists argue that transactional leadership styles are more effective in stable conditions 
and inspiration style is more likely in periods of rapid and discontinuous social change. And when you do have dramatic uh, social change, the style or inspirational style or transformational objectives of a Gandhi or a Mandela can make all the difference to outcomes in fluid social situations, particularly in developing countries where they're weakly structured institutions. In contrast, the context of American foreign policy is highly constrained by Congress, courts, and the Constitution. Uh, now, even with this framework of, kind of constraints, the great Princeton constitutional scholar Edward S. Corwin said the result was an invitation to struggle between the executive and the legislative branch. So there still is room for leaders, and crisis conditions can liberate a gifted leader from the accumulated constraints of vested interest groups and bureaucratic inertia that normally inhibit action. Bill Clinton is, was caught up in the complacent 1930s and is said to have envied Franklin Roosevelt the crisis conditions of the 1930s. But in any event, turbulent times may set the scene for transformational leaders, but it doesn't follow that bold and risk-loving leaders are always best suited to deal with the crises that define turbulent times. Now, in addition to the uh, transformational and incremental uh, dichotomy that we've talked about, leaders can change uh, or in the sense that they have a different set of skills. And the absence or presence of these skills affect the methods and styles that they use. So if we look at this chart, you'll see a set of skills here uh, which include the ability to use uh, soft power skills, emotional intelligence, vision, and communications, and hard power skills, organizational capacity, a Machiavellian political skills. And it may turn out that these differences or differences on these dimensions are more important than when a leader is whether a leader is transformational or transactional. In addition, effective leadership requires the skill of contextual intelligence, which is an intuitive diagnostic skill that helps the leader understand change, interpret the outside world, set objectives, and align strategies and tactics with objectives to create smart policies. It implies a capability to discern trends in the face of complexity as well as adaptability while trying to shape events. Bismarck, who I quoted earlier, once referred to this skill as the ability to intuit God's movements in history and seize the hem of his garment as he sweeps by. More prosaically, uh, like surfers, leaders with contextual intelligence have the judgment to adjust to new waves and ride them to success. Contextual intelligence is the self-made part of luck. In unstructured situation, it often is more difficult to ask the right questions than to get the right answers. And leaders with contextual intelligence are skilled in providing meaning or roadmap to defining the problem that a group confronts. They understand the tensions between the different values involved in an issue and they need to have an understanding of the group's culture, the distribution of power resources, followers' needs and demands, information flows, and timing. So how important was good presidential leadership in the sense of having leaders who had these sets of skills in explaining the creation of the American era? Uh, the word good itself is ambiguous. It means both ethical or effective, and sometimes both. I'm going to, in, uh, in this lecture, talk about effective as good and tomorrow ethical as good. Rather than looking just at transformational precedents to make these judgments, which would have the disadvantage of what social scientists call selecting on the dependent variable, I'm going to look at the seven presidents who played an important role in the creation and development of the American era during the four major stages of the creation of the American era. During the first phase, America's entry into global balance of, the global balance of power, I'll compare Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. In the second phase, America's entry into World War II, we'll look at Franklin Roosevelt's response to the rise of Germany and Japan 
The third stage was Harry Truman's successful transformation of Roosevelt's grand strategy into a permanent presence abroad for American troops. And Eisenhower followed by, by basically playing a crucial role in consolidating this new international order of containment. In the fourth phase of the creation of the American era, I'll compare the roles of Ronald Reagan, a transformational leader, with George H.W. Bush, a mostly incremental leader with a transactional style in ending the Cold War and creating the unipolar world. The principle of selection and comparison that I've used allows me to test the impact of transformational leadership on the creation of the American era, but it's important to be clear it's not an examination of all transformational leaders, nor all important events in 20th century American foreign policy. For example, I don't discuss Jack Kennedy's role in the Cuban Missile Crisis, Richard Nixon's opening to China, or Jimmy Carter's raising of the priority of human rights and nuclear nonproliferation in the 1970s. I'm not trying to present a complete history of leadership in American foreign policy. There's no rehearsal, for example, of the ill-conceived Vietnam War, not because it was unimportant, but because it was not a transformational stage that contributed to the creation of the American era, which is my focus here. So what about the creation of the American era from Teddy Roosevelt to George H.W. Bush? Well, leadership is a three-part process of interaction between leaders, followers, and the context in which they interact. And the context of America's role in the world began to change in the late 19th century. The American economy surpassed Britain in manufacturing in 1885, although the United States was perceived at home and abroad as a weak player. It had an army of only 25,000 and a navy smaller than that of Chile. A large but, con but temporary change occurred in America's role in the world at the very end of the 19th century. 1898, when the United States started the Spanish-American War and entered a brief period of taking colonies, was a striking departure. As recently as 1871, the US had turned down an offer of annexation from the Dominican Republic. But in the 1890s, as my former colleague Ernest May has shown, American elite attitudes split and briefly, there was a consensus for possessing overseas colonies. President William McKinley agreed to the annexations, but he was not leading the charge, uh, merely reacting to the followers. McKinley was not a transformational leader. By 1900, the whole brief episode was over, with public opinion turning unfavorable to further colonization in reaction to the Philippines insurrection and the Boer War and the anti-imperialist candidacy of William Jennings Bryant in that year's election. So this first excursion of America into US, of the United States into global politics did not last long. It was not the result of presidential leadership. America's brief flirtation with overseas colonialism turned out to be neither a true transformation nor guided by the top leader. The first phase of America's transformation really begins when America enters the global balance of power. And that is the 20th century under the leadership of two presidents, Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Interesting similarities, both were to win the Nobel Prize for their actions while in office. Both Ivy League are graduates, both authors of books, both strong believers in America's special God-given mission to the world and both inspirational in style and transformational in their progressive domestic agendas. But there the similarities end. In fact, the two men disliked each other, and they saw the world in very different ways. Teddy Roosevelt was the first president to deliberately project American power on the global stage. While he believed in American exceptionalism and the civilizing mission of the Anglo-Saxon peoples, his worldview was that of a realist who saw the shifting global balance of power. His famous speech about walking softly and carrying a big stick was delivered in 1901, and his early actions, such as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, were very traditional rather than transformational. Roosevelt's real innovation 
was in his perception of the shifting balance of power in Europe and Asia and the steps he took to insert the United States into it by mediating in the Russo-Japanese War and in the, con and the, uh, uh, the Moroccan crisis between France and Germany. But Roosevelt did little to educate the American public about this strategic vision that he had. As a result, he succeeded in transforming the way the United States was perceived and acted globally as a power, but not in transforming the way in which the American public saw their role in the world. Roosevelt's leadership transformed America's role in the world, but not his followers' views, and thus its impact was limited, as Kiss Henry Kissinger noted in the comment I cited earlier. Ironically, for a man who extolled the value of the bully or good pulpit, which was the presidency, and used it to transform domestic affairs, uh, he was unable to use it to transform the public understanding of American foreign policy. In that sense, despite the most engaging and energetic of styles, Teddy Roosevelt failed as a transformational leader in foreign policy. Like Woodrow Wilson, like Teddy Roosevelt, was a transformational leadership in establishing the progressive reform movement uh, in domestic policy, but he was little interested in foreign policy. His early interventions in Mexico and the Caribbean were reactive, rather naive, and very much in the American foreign policy tradition. Yet Wilson presided over a pivotal point in America's involvement in global politics when he sent two million troops to fight in the European war. Quite a long way from that first quotation I had from George Washington that we started with. Roosevelt saw World War I in balance of power terms. And he was very clear that American interests were aligned with Britain's and he lobbied for Americans' entry. Wilson saw it differently, however. Wilson disliked the concept of power balances. In his view, it meant that the great powers treated small nations like cheeses to be cut up for the convenience of the large. He felt there should be more principled approach to global order that would be more consistent with American moral principles. At one point after a German U-boat sank the liner Lusitania in 1915, Wilson proclaimed that there's such a thing as a man being too proud to fight and a nation being so right that it does not need to convince others by force that it is right. Quite different from Teddy Roosevelt. During his first term, Wilson insisted on neutrality and sent his aide, Colonel House, to Europe to try to mediate a peace without victors. Wilson expressed his objective in very incremental terms up until the beginning of 1917. And all that while, Teddy Roosevelt was complaining and criticizing about Wilson for his moralistic approach and his failure to see American interests in an Allied victory. Shortly after winning re-election in November 1916 on a promise to keep the U.S. out of war, Wilson was confronted by Germany's resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare and the provocative Zimmerman telegraph to stir up trouble in Mexico. Feeling trapped, Wilson largely relied on his own counsel in early 1917. He looked carefully at three major options, continued neutrality, armed neutrality to try to protect ships at sea, and full entry into the war on the side of the Allies. Rather than pursuing the cautious middle option, Wilson chose the most audacious, as Roosevelt urged. But he then did something Roosevelt would not have done. Rather than explaining the balance of power reasons for entry into the war Roosevelt might have done, Wilson wrapped his choice in American moralism. In presenting his 14 points to Congress and the world, he outlined a new set of principles, including a League of Nations for a more moral order in world politics, one that would be consistent with what he saw as American values. He prevailed in persuading a majority of the American people to follow him, and in the successful prosecution of the war at home and in Europe, he was truly transformational. 
both an objective and outcome. It is not clear that another, another president, even Teddy Roosevelt, could have been as successful. In the short run, Wilson transformed the views of his followers to support an action totally at odds with existing American foreign policy tradition. But Wilson had two transformational objectives. One was to change American foreign policy, and the other to change the very nature of world politics. And he linked the two together. Where Wilson failed, of course, was in transforming the attitudes of other world leaders, and ultimately the American public about the new world order he had outlined. Initially, Wilson was treated as a hero by European crowds. But as the haggling in Versailles dragged on for six months, the nationalist constituents of Clemenceau, Lloyd George, and Orlando proved more deeply rooted and persistent. At Versailles, Wilson compromised on many of his 14 points in order to obtain agreement on the covenant of the League of Nations with its obligations of collective security. But on return to the United States, he refused to compromise with Senator Henry Cabot Lodge even instructing Democratic supporters of the League to vote against the treaty rather than compromise. Wilson thought instead that his inspirational style could win over the public, and he went on a barnstorming tour in the autumn of 1919, but it was cut short by illness. By the time of the final negotiations, when Wilson stubbornly refused to compromise and the Senate killed the treaty, Wilson was a very sick man. Ironically, if the stroke he suffered in 1919 had killed rather than debilitated him, the Senate would probably have ratified the treaty, and the United States would have joined the new League of Nations. Whether American participation could have staved off the events in Manchuria and Ethiopia that contributed to the disaster of the 1930s is uncertain. But in the meantime, the compromises that Wilson made at Versailles to obtain the League undercut the other great principle uh, that he propounded, which was self-determination. By leaving and establishing and leaving situations like German minorities in Czechoslovakia and in the Danzig Corridor of Poland, Wilson basically uh, was setting off time bombs which Hitler, or putting in place time bombs which Hitler would detonate in 1938 and 1939. Wilson's objective to transform the world into one made safe for democracy had failed. Moreover, Wilson's efforts to use American exceptionalism to convert his followers to a new approach to foreign policy also failed for the next two decades. Ironically, by the 1930s, public reaction to Wilson's true transformational achievement of bringing the United States into World War I led to a virulent isolationism that complicated the situation that Franklin Roosevelt inherited. Overly ambitious transformational objectives, combined with overconfidence in an inspirational style, ultimately proved counterproductive to the smooth creation of an American era. That brings us to the second phase of the transformation that created the American era, the entry into World War II. As we've seen, Franklin Roosevelt, when it came to foreign policy, was transactional rather than inspirational. Given the strong isolationist sentiment among his followers, Roosevelt was very careful not to get too far ahead of his public. In style, it's almost as if there were two Roosevelt presidencies in the 1930s. On foreign policy, Roosevelt had reasonable contextual intelligence, uh, but more about Europe than Asia. He was a supporter of the League who had served in Wilson's Navy Department and had broad knowledge of Europe through travel. Not surprisingly, however, given the state of the economy in the Depression, uh, FDR came into office paying little attention to foreign policy. He had no transformational objectives for foreign policy. When he entered office, in fact, in line with American tradition, he allowed his State Department to focus on trade and on a good neighbor policy for Latin America. It's interesting to note that Hitler and Roosevelt were elected to office in the same year, but only gradually did Roosevelt become aware of the threat that Hitler posed. In 1937, during the Spanish Civil War, Roosevelt gently and ambiguously suggested a quarantine on both sides 
but he quickly withdrew his toe from that water when the domestic politics proved to make it too hot. In 1938, two events, Kristallnacht and the Munich Agreement, were the turning points in Roosevelt's personal views, but publicly he supported the Munich Agreement. He knew he had to change American foreign policy, but what does a leader who develops transformational objectives do when his contextual intelligence discerns a slowly growing threat, but his followers don't see it? Over the next three years, while adhering to a doctrine of non-intervention in public, FDR privately prepared a set of measures to get the U.S. ready for war when it eventually came. Steps like trading destroyers for British bases in the Caribbean, or Lend-Lease, which he analogized to temporary loan of a garden hose to a neighbor, were presented to the American people as purely transactional. Other measures, such as basing troops in Iceland, were justified by stretching the traditional terms about protecting the Western Hemisphere. A leader must always look over his shoulder and adjust his or her speed in a democracy. But what can a leader do if, after looking over his shoulder, he notices that the followers are marching in the opposite direction? One possibility is to try to create crises to help educate the public. FDR tried to engineer a number of incidents at sea, even outright lying about the alleged attack of a German submarine upon the USS destroyer Greer, but to no avail. In the end, FDR's dilemma was solved by Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and Hitler's mistake of declaring war on the US in support of his Axis ally. After December 7, 1941, Roosevelt was then able to unleash his full rhetorical capabilities and indulge his inspirational style in foreign policy. It's ironic that it was Asia that solved his dilemma of how to hit enter Hitler's war. In this sense, despite the tragedy of lives lost, Pearl Harbor was an element of luck for Roosevelt. It allowed him to transform American foreign policy dramatically and ensure that the attitudes of the American public would be supportive of the new approach despite his previous failure to convert them away from isolationism in the 1930s. So now let's look at the third phase of the transformation containment and the establishment of an American permanent presence overseas. Harry Truman could not have been more different in his background than his predecessors, where the two Roosevelts had degrees from, uh, and all three actually, Roosevelt Wilson, both two Roosevelt Wilson had degrees from Harvard and Princeton. Truman was a little man with glasses from Missouri who never attended college and spent 10 years working on his father's farm. While the two Roosevelts came into office with considerable contextual intelligence about foreign affairs, Truman's international experience was limited to two and a half months, or no, to a year as an officer in the artillery in France during World War I, and two and a half months as Roosevelt's vice president, but Roosevelt never consulted him about anything important. In David McCullough's words, Truman was a 19th century man and yet he made some of the most important foreign policy decisions of the 20th century, both in establishing the grand strategy of containment that persisted for four decades and in creating domestic and international institutions. If Wilson and FDR broke from the tradition by sending large American armies overseas, Truman was pivotal by moving foreign policy from Washington's no entangling alliances to a permanent presence abroad and a NATO alliance that lasts into this century. Truman did not come into office with transformational objectives, and he certainly didn't have an inspirational style. He was a regular Wilsonian Democrat committed to implementing Roosevelt's grand design. Some critics say that Truman really came in with a Cold War mentality, and they cite the visit that uh, Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov paid to the White House in April 1945, where Truman dressed him down uh, quite sharply. But that incident reflected Truman's naive reaction to Soviet lies rather than a transformational objective. If anything, like Roosevelt, Truman underestimated Stalin's malevolent intentions and mistakenly compared him 
to Voss Prendergast of Kansas City. Even George Kennan's long telegram from Moscow warned Washington about Soviet intentions. Even after that, Truman tried to preserve FDR's policy. He asked his trusted aide, Clark Clifford, to poll the views of people in the government. When Clifford reported, when Clifford's report reinforced Kennan and said that Kennan was probably right in the summer of 1946, Truman ordered that the report be restricted to 10 copies and locked up in a safe. This was not a man eager for transformation into a Cold War. It was not until February 1947, in the context of Soviet probes and British withdrawal in the Eastern Mediterranean, that he agreed to the great transformational steps of the Truman Doctrine, followed the next year by the Marshall Plan, and then NATO the year after that. But was Truman a transformational leader in responding to this newly perceived context, or did he merely ratify the views of the wise men who surrounded him? Was he a mere McKinley? Like many government actions, the great decisions of the third uh, phase of the American creation of the American era were to some extent collective. But what was Truman's role? Was he a mere conduit for others as he had been largely when he agreed to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima a little after, over three months after he came into office? I think such a picture underestimates Truman leadership, Truman's leadership in three ways, four ways. First, it misses his ability to select and command the respect of the impressive team he appointed. Second, it underrates his on-the-job learning and his ability to develop contextual intelligence while in office. Third, it misses his willingness to take tough decisions, such as standing up to Marshall on Israel, firing MacArthur, and resisting the use of nuclear weapons after the Korean War bogged down. Similarly, Truman resisted full funding for the hawkish document NSC 68 that Paul Nitze and others had prepared until the North Korean invasion changed the situation. But above all, it misses, this criticism misses Truman's Wilsonian view of American exceptionalism and the difference that made to the way the doctrine of containment was formulated. As John Gaddis has pointed out, it was Truman's decision to follow Atchison and Vandenberg's advice to frame containment as a defense of free people everywhere rather than an issue of the balance of power in the Eastern Mediterranean. George Kennan was dismayed by this militarization and ideological expansion of his original concept. But Truman's emphasis on the values embodied in his doctrine and in the Marshall Plan also contributed to the institutionalization of the Atlantic Alliance. The liberal nature of American hegemony that John Eikenberry has described made it more stable. In the words of a Norwegian scholar, Geir Lundstad, America succeeded in maintaining the allegiance of post-war Europe because it was, in Lundstad's words, an empire by invitation. In any event, it was Truman's interpretation of the objectives of containment that guided foreign policy as the United States responded to the new structure of bipolarity after World War II. Truman entered office with neither transformational objectives nor an inspirational style. His style remained transactional, but through on-the-job learning, he became a transformational foreign policy leader. Finally, let me turn to the fourth phase of the creation of the American order, um, when America becomes the world's sole superpower. And this is the period presided over by two very different Republican presidents, Ronald Reagan and his vice president and successor, George H.W. Bush. Reagan's leadership presents a series of paradoxes. He had serious deficiencies in cognitive knowledge, but superb emotional effectiveness. <laughs> like FDR, his performance suggests there are instances where leadership in leadership where style is substance. Reagan restored American self-confidence after a difficult decade. Despite his cognitive weaknesses, a sober, sober journal like The Economist called him one of the most consequential presidents of the 20th century, but also concluded that this champion of simplicity was himself surprisingly hard to make sense of. Reagan's leadership skills included the ability to present a vision 
that was attractive to American followers by stressing the moral clarity of good versus evil. And he had the best ability to communicate it to the public of any president since Franklin Roosevelt. Like FDR, Reagan had emotional IQ and great ability as an actor, as well as impressive Machiavellian political skills. He was very good at bargaining and pragmatic about forming coalitions. He would talk tough, but then bargain. Rhetoric about an evil empire did not prevent him from reaching agreements with Gorbachev. In addition to his deficient knowledge base, Reagan's weakness was in his organizational capacity. He depended on those he appointed, and after delegation, was inattentive to a fault. Unlike Eisenhower, who Fred Greenstein has described as a hidden hand president who knew how to be a monarch in public but a prime minister behind the scenes, Reagan played the monarch but without the hidden hand. He failed to understand the implications of the switch of jobs between Donald Reagan and James Baker and at Treasury and Chief of Staff in the White House in 1985 that set the scene for a scandal that nearly destroyed his presidency. He had six NSC advisors over eight years, but was still never able to manage the conflict between George Shultz and Caspar Weinberger that plagued the relations between state and defense. Moreover, failure to monitor highly risky appointees like William Casey, John Poindexter, and Oliver North nearly led to the destruction of the presidency in the Iran-Contra scandal, which traded arms for hostages and misused the proceeds for covert action in Central America. As for contextual IQ, Reagan saw the big picture and simplified terms of his values, and that gave him a strong sense of direction and a conviction about his objectives, but he was unable to master all the details. In the words of David Absher, who served Reagan and helped to clean up the Iran-Contra scandal in 1987, and I quote, in Ronald Reagan, perhaps the United States has never had a president with such great talent for transformational and so little interest in transactional leadership. Reagan was transformational in his objectives and inspirational in his style, but it's debatable how transformational he was in outcomes. Remember I distinguished transformational objectives, inspirational style, but then there's also objectives. Did you succeed or not in transforming things? His initial objective was to change the detente orientation that had characterized containment since the Nixon administration and get tougher with the Soviet Union. In this, he succeeded. But Reagan deserves most credit for being able to shift to negotiations. He intuited the willingness of Gorbachev to bargain well before other members of his administration did. And then he was able to establish a good working relationship. One of Reagan's strongest transformational objectives, however, was to rid the world of nuclear weapons. And on this, of course, he failed. And I could go into the Reykjavik summit, but I'm keeping an eye on the clock and I won't. Uh, So was Reagan transformational in bringing about the end of the Cold War? His actions contributed to the outcome, but not nearly as much as those of Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev was truly transformational in his effects, but not in the direction that he wanted to be. His aim was to reform rather than destroy the Soviet Union. Without the unintended consequences of his efforts, the Soviet Union would probably have been able to limp along for another decade or so. The true deep causes of the Soviet collapse were structural, the decline of communist ideology and the failure of the Soviet economy. Reagan had the intuition and political skills to see Gorbachev as a bargaining partner, But it's also true that if Yuri Andropov, a noted Soviet hardliner who died of kidney failure, had not had poor kidneys, or alternative, if Gorbachev had come to power five years earlier when Jimmy Carter was president and seeking a valid interlocutor, Reagan's strategy and causal role would not have mattered much. Reagan was lucky that Gorbachev was in the deck of cards that was dealt to him. But his intuition and bargaining skill allowed him to contribute toward his transformational objective, and he deserves credit for skillful handling of Gorbachev. On the other hand, his larger role in the causation of the end of the Cold War was not key to that transformation. And finally, I turn to George H.W. Bush. The final 
dissolution of the Soviet Union occurred in December 1991 under the presidency of George H.W. Bush. Like FDR, Bush had a patrician background and an Ivy League education, albeit Yale. But unlike, <laughs> but unlike FDR or Ronald Reagan, Bush was neither a great communicator nor an accomplished actor, and that gave him a very transactional style on most issues. Like Eisenhower, though at a different level, Bush was a distinguished combat veteran, but his upbringing made him reticent about self-promotion. Also like Eisenhower, Bush was among the most experienced men in international affairs to occupy the presidency, and this gave him an excellent contextual intelligence. He also shared uh, great organizational skills in putting together an effective national security process and good emotional intelligence in terms of his ability to uh, handle the management, the dismantling of the Cold War. At the same time, these traits limited Bush's ability to use his office to educate the public. While he spoke about a new world order, a phrase that he borrowed from Gorbachev, and a democratic peace, he never articulated or communicated these concepts as a vision that could capture public opinion. Although Bush was incremental in his objectives when he came into office, he presided successfully over a major transformation of world politics. When the Bush administration entered office, it was skeptical of Reagan's infatuation with Gorbachev and cautious in picking up where Reagan left off. In particular, it didn't share Reagan's nuclear abolitionism. But after the Malta summit in 1989, Bush demonstrated extraordinary skill in managing the unification of Germany within NATO against the advice of many advisors and allies, and the eventual peaceful disarmament of the dismantlement of the Soviet Union in 1991. Critics like Zbig Brzezinski, who was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, have praised Bush for his skillful management of a transformational moment in history, but faulting him for failing to set more transformational objectives in his own foreign policy. Bush is famous as saying, I don't do the vision thing. And despite pleas from his advisors, he was reluctant to follow Reagan's ambitious objectives or rhetorical style. He failed to develop a new or broader vision that set new objectives. Brzezinski, for example, faults him for not setting objectives relating to democracy, promoting democracy in Russia, pushing harder for a Middle East peace, or stopping proliferation in North Korea and South Asia. Instead, Bush emphasized prudence, except on Germany, where his goal of unification was more transformational than many of his advisors. But in general, Bush believed he had to balance many changes at the same time. Berlin, Kuwait, Tiananmen Square, civil war in Yugoslavia, and others. Bush's objectives were based on realist prudence. His objective was to preside over extraordinary and favorable external change without dropping any of the balls that were in the air. If any of those balls that Bush was juggling had been dropped, the consequences could have been disastrous for the world and for the consolidation of the American era. In such circumstances, Bush might ask critics who complained that he presided over a transformation but did not sufficiently adjust his own incremental objectives to build upon it, he might ask them, is it better to have an incremental leader with prudence or a transformational leader with an unusual vision? To conclude all this and leave some time for some questions, how effective were transformational and inspirational leaders? Well, leadership theorists tend in general to assume that transformational leaders are better. Uh, as we noted earlier, that can mean more effective or more ethical, uh, but let's just look at effectiveness for tonight. Basically, of the seven leaders who presided over the creation of the American era, you can say that uh, the record is varied. And let me try to summarize it uh, in another slide. If you look at of the seven leaders, who presided over the America, creation of the American era, five, five were transformational in their objectives, if we forget Truman's first two years. And two, Eisenhower and Bush, were mostly incrementalist in their objectives. 
Two were primarily inspirational in style, Wilson and Reagan, and three primarily transactional, Truman, Ike, and Bush. In terms of outcomes in the world, did they change the world, five were successful in contributing to significant change by the end of their administrations, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Reagan, and Bush. And FDR, Truman, and Reagan were able to transform the attitudes of their followers by the end of their administrations. At best, this is a mixed scorecard, with only three who held transformational objectives, FDR, Truman, and Reagan, contributing to major changes in America's position in the world as measured by the outcome a decade after they served. And of those who were primarily inspirational in style in their foreign policy, one failed and one succeeded. Moreover, Eisenhower and Bush, who were both primarily incremental in their objectives and transactional in their styles, are often with credit with having among the very best foreign policies of this period of the creation of the American era. While they did not set out to change foreign policy, their extraordinary contextual intelligence and prudent management avoided crises that might well have derailed the creation of the American era. If the United States had succumbed to the temptations of isolationism, rollback, or the use of nuclear weapons in the 1950s, or if the unification of Germany and the disintegration of the Soviet Union had been accompanied by violence and loss of control of nuclear weapons in the Bush era, the outcomes of the creation of the American era would have looked very different. It's worth noticing that non-events can be as important to an effective foreign policy as events. In looking back at these patterns of history, you have to notice the dogs that do not bark as well as those that do. Thus, the evidence is far from supportive of the proposition that transformational leaders are necessarily more effective than incremental leaders, or that an inspirational style is more effective when it comes to foreign policy. Success depends more on other variables than on whether a leader has a transformational or incremental objective or inspirational or transactional style, as we saw in Table 2. For example, if Woodrow Wilson had possessed better emotional intelligence, he might have been less stubborn and more willing to compromise with the Senate and allow the ratification of the League of Nations. While his stubbornness was partly a function of poor health after his stroke, he had demonstrated a similar emotional rigidity at an earlier stage in his career at Princeton. If Ronald Reagan had had better organizational skills, he might have avoided the Iran-Contra scandal and pressed further in his dealings with Gorbachev. If Bush had been a, a better communicator or been brought up to be less modest, might he have set higher goals at the end of the Cold War? We cannot know, but at least we can avoid falling into easy assumptions that transformational is synonymous with more effective foreign policy leadership. In the paper from which this is drawn, I look at some alternatives and say, what if the most likely candidate who could have been president instead of this president had been elected, and what would the results be? But I'm going to spare you that now because of time. And simply say, in surveying some of these speculative counterfactual exercises, it seems clear that most of these seven leaders made a difference both in the timing and the particular characteristics of the creation of the American era. Would structural forces have brought about the same American era under different leaders? Teddy Roosevelt affected mostly timing, and that was not very significant. Wilson brought American forces to fight in Europe, but that might have occurred anyway. Where Wilson made a big difference was in American, the moral term, tone of his justification. As for FDR, uh, it's debatable whether structural forces would have brought the U.S. into World War II anyway under a conservative isolationist like a Lindbergh presidency. Uh, but FDR's framing of the threat from Hitler and his preparation for taking advantage of his luck was crucial. Structural bipolarity set the framework of the Cold War, but a Henry Wallace presidency might have changed the timing and style of the American response if it was there instead of a Truman presidency. And as for Eisenhower, a Taft or MacArthur presidency might have disrupted the relatively smooth consolidation of the containment system over which Eisenhower presided. 
Structural forces caused the erosion of the Soviet superpower, and Gorbachev speeded up the timing of Soviet collapse. But Reagan's skill in negotiation and Bush's skill in managing crises were important to the final outcome in the creation of the American system. So to conclude, leadership matters, but how much? Scholars who've tried to measure the effects of leadership in corporations or in laboratory experiments sometimes come up with numbers that range in area of 10 or 15 percent, depending on the context. But these are structured situations. In unstructured situations, such as post-apartheid South Africa, the transformation of the leadership of a Nelson Mandela rather than one of the alternative African leaders made a huge difference. American foreign policy is structured by institutions and a constitution, as we saw earlier. But external crises can cause a context much more susceptible to transformational leadership, for better and for worse. Since foreign policy events are both path dependent, relatively small event choices by leaders, in the, even in the range of 10 or 15 percent, can lead to major divergent outcomes over time. Transformational leadership may not be necessarily better, in the sense of more effective, than incremental leadership in foreign policy. And an inspirational style is not necessarily better than a transactional one. But as Robert Frost put it, when two paths diverge in a wood, taking the one less traveled by can sometimes make all the difference. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, we'll sit.